Sias pel sustos, sias apasios, salmo, salmo, sal. Transylvanian magic is deeply rooted in Ilo Tempore, the mythical time of immemorial origins and primeval magic. From the mythical roots to the present, it flows as electric life force on the cosmic evergreen tree, animating on its way the soul of the world. Its wielders are the Solomonari or Sholomonari, solitary sages, sorcerers and shamans, who live with one foot in this world and the other in the spirit realm, keeping close watch over mankind. They are custodians of the cosmos who walk on clouds, forge weather, tame dragons, heal diseases, command the legions of Strigoi and Moroi, and commune with the old gods and the ancestors. They know all the spells and languages of the earth, of all animals and men, and they carry their arcane knowledge in a magical book. And they have learned it all at the Scholomans, the school of magic believed to be hidden in Transylvania, where the headmaster is said to be none other than the devil. My name is Radiana, and I shall carry you over the threshold to that mythical time, when spells and stories come to life, a time both then and now, when all magic is possible. It is such a dimension, that of storytelling, where the Scholomans exist today and where I first came to know it as a little girl. Tales of the Solomonari, their craft likewise called Solomonaria or Solomanza, and their magical school animated my imagination, as I am sure it did for many others who have heard the old tales. The legend certainly piqued the interest of an Irish writer once, Bram Stoker. In his gothic novel Dracula, from 1897, he wrote that the noble vampire learned the secrets of the evil one at the Skullmans, amongst the mountains over Lake Hermannstadt, where the devil claims the tenth scholar as his due. It is believed he was inspired by an essay called Transylvanian Superstitions, written in 1885 by Emily Gerard, a Scottish writer who became familiar with the legend while being stationed with her husband in Transylvania. She wrote that the Scholomance was a school supposed to exist somewhere in the heart of the mountains, where all the secrets of nature, the language of animals, and all imaginable magic spells and charms are taught by the devil in person. Only ten scholars are admitted at a time, and when the curse of learning has expired and nine of them are released to return to their homes, the tenth scholar is detained by the devil as payment, and, mounted upon a dragon, he becomes henceforward the devil's aide-de-camp, and assists him in making the weather, that is, in preparing thunderbolts. A small lake, immeasurably deep, lying high up among the mountains south of Hermannstadt, is supposed to be the cauldron where it's brewed the thunder, and, in fair weather, the dragon sleeps beneath the waters. Before the 1885 essay, when Romanian folklore research started to bloom, scholars of the Habsburg Empire had already documented the legend in the 18th century. After conquering Transylvania, imperial delegates were sent here to investigate and administer the region. And alongside the many tales of Strigoi, Moroi, Prikolic, and other fantastic creatures, they likewise reported on the legend of Skolomans and its weather-forging students. Some details may vary from one region to another, but as the legend goes, the Skolomans is hidden deep in the Apusen Mountains of Transylvania, in an underground cave or located in the other world, the spirit realm at the center of the world, which could perhaps be accessed by going through the cave. It is concealed from prying eyes, and even if one were to look for it, they would not be able to find it unless they were themselves magical in some way, and able to read the invisible runes and ciphers at its entrance. The students are chosen by Elder Solomonari in numbers of 7, 9, 10 or 13, based on their predisposition for magic, unusual birth, or other criteria such as the seventh child of a seventh child. And so they are taken to the location in great secrecy. There, the devil, an archdemon named Unila, or a forgotten pagan god, 
teaches them the languages of all living things and all the magical secrets of the universe for the next three or seven years. Throughout the school, there are countless heavy grindstones barely hanging from a thread, and those who wish to become Solomonai must pass under them as a first test. Afraid, many do not dare to pass and return to their homes. Those who do, however, enter the underground chamber where they study for the following years, and the tests only become harder as time goes by. Folks say that the students see no sunlight, for the only light that reaches them is that of arcane knowledge springing from their books, and so they must learn how to ride and tame dragons called Balauri, command the legions of the undead called Moroi and Strigoi, practice spells and charms to bind and unbind the weather, harness the vital energy in food without eating it, and draw milk from wood. Their final test is to transcribe the entire knowledge of all humanity in their magical tome. Then and only then, after years of discipline and seclusion, would they be initiated as Solomonari and endowed with the power to ascend to the heavens as masters of the ether. At their graduation, they receive their magic book, a wooden staff, and reins made of gold or birch wood. Some also receive a tiny semantron to be worn as a chest plate that can summon the winds. Others may receive a drum or a rattle instead. And so they ascend from the underground cave to the clouds, shrouded in mists and fog, and raise their staffs to return into the same world. But not all of them return. One of them, some say, may have died or may have been kept as a token. Others say that the one who has yet to return is the only Solomonar, while the rest are instead dragon riders or weather wizards, known by other names too, such as Pietrari, Hultani, Getzari, Zgrabunzash, or cloud banishers, depending on the region. But their craft, as the folks came to understand it in the olden days, seems to be predominantly meteorological, while there is much more to the Solomonar than meets the eye. In an article from 1878, written by Romanian folklorist Simeon Florea Marian, Solomonari are described as some sort of malicious people, a kind of strigoi who, inspired by their teacher, the devil, and endowed with his powers, climb on the wings of the winds and fogs in the clouds and begin carrying the rains, and especially the storms and hailstorms of the heaviest, scariest and most dangerous kind. They boil ice among the clouds out of sheer pleasure, because they have nothing else to do, and then carry it and pour it over deserted mountains, fields, waters, and any place where they know they would not cause any damage. The article also describes how the Solmonari mount their dragons, and read from their magical books to enchant them and the lakes in which they dwell and from which they create hail and how, when they are bored with forging weather, they hide their books and descend to villages pretending to be blind or limp. Some of them wreak havoc and stir tempests, while others become protectors who banish the dark clouds muttering words in unknown languages. Those are dearly loved by the people and rewarded for their help in protecting them from their more mischievous counterparts. The same article also addresses the mysterious Solomonar, the one who stays behind at the school and who seems different from the rest. Those who act as cloud banishers and are often seen wandering around human communities are said to have their meteorological powers from the devil only for several years before they expire. In their old age, they are believed to become normal human beings who settle and die among the people. It is said that cloud banishers have a predisposition for magic from childhood, but the other Solomonari is said to be born with unique powers and a heightened sensitivity to the spirit world, magic abilities that cannot be taught and which do not expire, and they may be delivered during cosmic events such as meteor showers or falling stars, during tempests or on unusually hot or cold days, and they may also have signs on their infant bodies, such as teeth, 
hair, a tail, or call. In certain Transylvanian regions, if the child is born on call, the parents remove it and bury it at the roots of a sacred tree. It is said that as the child grows, so does the call, transforming it into a magical garment. When the child comes of age, they dig up the call and wear it, sometimes substituted by a traditional Carpathian blouse, to better control their meteorological powers and supernatural abilities. Such children might still attend the scholomans to expand their skills or dedicate themselves to a divine purpose. Unlike their colleagues who return to human communities as cloud banishers, the other Solomonar experiences a symbolic death when he enters the cave of the school, vanishing from the face of the earth. And after descending into the Chthonic underworld, the Solomonar ascends as a solar hero, a divine sage who can walk on clouds. Cloud walkers were solitaries and sages known to the ancient Greco-Roman world as Kapnobatai, which means those who walk in smoke or on clouds. They were perhaps the precursors of the pagan Greek Nephodioctai and the Tempestari or Tempestatum Ductores mentioned in laws and decrees across medieval Europe. The ancient Thracian cloud walkers were described according to Posidonius as ascetic castes among the theocratic tribes of the Mysians and Dacians of Thrace, the ancestors of the Romanian people who lived on the territory of present-day Transylvania and beyond. Cloud walkers and other such solitary sages were believed to have played an important role in the spiritual evolution of their tribes. They lived outside of settlements, near lakes, rivers, woods, and in the mountains, with only milk and honey for sustenance, as they have been dedicated to the gods and lived with freedom from every fear. And Dacian cloud walkers believed in a god who was at once a god of life and death, whose cult of mysteries seems to have become, through ages of syncretism and ethnogenesis, the scholars of Transylvanian folk magic and lore. The god's name was Zalmoxis, sometimes written as Salmoxis. In the 5th century BC, Herodotus wrote that the Dacians, who are the bravest of the Thracians and the most just, believe they are immortal forever, living in the following sense. They think they do not die, and that the one who dies joins Salmoxis. According to Herodotus, who heard it from the Greeks of the Hellespont and the Black Sea, Salmoxis served Pythagoras on the island of Samos, where he learned the sciences of the skies and had been initiated into Ionian life and the Eleusinian mysteries. Upon returning to his homeland, he brought with him the arts of healing and incantation, and he taught his people that neither they nor their descendants would ever die, but instead their immortal souls would continue to exist. Thereafter, he dug himself an underground chamber, a cave in the mountains, where he vanished. Believing him dead, his people mourned him, only for him to return three years later and remind them of his teachings. Rather skeptical of the story, Herodotus also adds, Now I neither disbelieve nor entirely believe the tale about Salmoxis and his underground chamber, but I think that he lived long before Pythagoras. As to whether there was a man called Salmoxis or this is some deity native to the Dacians, let the question be dismissed. Whether Salmoxis was the god incarnate, an adept by the same name, or not a person at all, we may never know. Aristotle compared him to Atlas, while others compared him to Kronos, and even referred to him as Salmoxis the Saturn. And some even today speculate that the legacy of Salmoxis and his mysteries is far older than that of the Indo-Europeans. Plato's dialogues provide a glimpse into his mysteries, through Socrates as he recounts what he was told by one of the physicians of the Thracian king Salmoxis, who are said to be so skillful that they can even give immortality. Salmoxis, our king, who is also a god, says that as you ought not to attempt to cure the eyes without the head, or the head without the body, so neither ought you to attempt to cure the body without the soul. And this is the reason why the cure of many diseases is unknown to the physicians of Hellas, 
because they are ignorant of the whole, which ought to be studied also, for the part can never be well unless the whole is well. For all good and evil, whether in the body or in human nature, originates in the soul and overflows from there, as if from the head into the eyes. And therefore, if the head and body are to be well, you must begin by curing the soul. And the cure has to be effected by the use of certain charms. And these charms are fair words, and by them temperance is implanted in the soul. And where temperance is, there health is speedily imparted, not only to the head, but to the whole body. This is the great error of our day in the treatment of the human body, that physicians separate the soul from the body. And so it could be this philosophy of reconciliation between man and divinity through the practice of sacred mysteries that perhaps inspired the scholomans. And Zalmoxis perhaps also inspired the archaic versions of the word Solomonar, which are Zalmonar or Salman, and which are cognate with words like shaman, holy figure and wandering monk from other languages of Indo-European origin. During Christian proselytization in the early modern era, efforts were made to distance people from their ancestral pagan beliefs, and so the term Solomonar became more common as the indigenous storm wizards were demonized under King Solomon, to whom the wind was made subservient, and who could likewise speak the language of animals. And so the shaman seekers of divine wisdom were corrupted by the devil and became evil sorcerers hell-bent on using their meteorological magic to damage the crops and households of the people. Not merely that, the clergy also created a repenting Solomonar, one who attended the scholomans but who chose to live among the people and renounce the old ways, instead using the magic they studied to counter the actions of the others. But the imperial scholars documenting the legend of Scholomans in the 18th century, paying attention to the accounts of the people and not only the altered version of the church, connected the word Scholomonar with Schulmeiner, the German word for scholar, thus indicating that these magical people were also erudite. The respect and profound admiration of the common folk for those who toiled for knowledge created a favorable atmosphere for the deification of sages until their schools of thought were deemed heresy. Notably, in the 3rd century, Hippolytus of Rome wrote in his refutation of all heresies that the Celtic Druids investigated the very highest point the Pythagorean philosophy, after Zalmoxis by Bertha Thracian, a servant of Pythagoras, became to them the originator of this discipline. The Celts esteemed these as prophets and seers on account of their foretelling to them certain events, from calculations and numbers by the Pythagorean art. On the methods of which very art also we shall not keep silence, since also from these some have presumed to introduce heresies, but the Druids resort to magical rites likewise. The criticism of the Christian theologian has since been extended to indigenous sages and schools of thought across Europe. And so we find mentions of diabolical schools throughout European folklore. Namely, the cave of Salamanca in western Spain not only has phonetic similarities with the Scholomans, but its legend has an uncanny resemblance to it. The cave of Salamanca is said to be the former crypt of the church of St. Cyprian the Mage, where the devil disguised as a sacristan was believed to have taught black magic to seven chosen students every night. Once the studies were completed, he would keep one of them via lottery. An earlier version of the Spanish legend from the 15th century claims that the Greek hero Hercules, having arrived in Salamanca, wanted to enlighten the people and so he dug a large hole in the ground inside which he placed the seven liberal arts and many other books. Then he summoned the natives of the country to frequent said cave, but since they were rude and did not understand so much wonder, and the mythical founder had to continue his exploits in other settings, he reconciled his plan that such a study be maintained with the construction of a statue of his, to which he conferred the gift of speech, and trusting to him the answers of the zealous students who really wanted to learn, as if Hercules were there in person. But the Dark Ages darkened the collective mind, and soon the Illuminary Hercules was replaced with Asmodeus and other demons who offered classes of black magic to a chosen few, only to gamble with their freedom afterward. 
Similar stories can also be found in Icelandic folklore about the Svartiskoli or the Black School believed to be somewhere in Europe in an unknown location. Simundra de Lorland was among the three known Icelanders believed to have sailed to the Black School, where he learned the dark arts. It is said that he entered the school, although above the entrance was written, You may come in, your soul is lost, and he knew that he would not be able to leave for the next three to seven years. Inside, there were no windows, and it was always pitch black, with the only light coming from the fiery letters inside the magical books he had to read. And there were no masters nor staff, only students. A grey and hairy hand is said to have come through the wall every day to hand the students food. And whenever he would need to find a book to further his studies, it would appear the next day. And if he had a question, the answer would magically appear written on the walls. Upon graduation, all students had to leave at the same time. If one of them would be left behind, the devil would keep them until the next graduation. And so they will always draw lots to determine who would be at the back of the group. On more than one occasion, the lot fell on Saimundra, and so he remained longer than most. It is said that one day, a bishop found out that Saimundra was trapped in the black school, so he offered him advice on how to escape as long as he returned to Iceland and behaved as a good Christian. Saimundra agreed, but as he and the bishop attempted to leave the school, the devil caught him and made him a deal. If he could hide from him for three days, he would allow him to return to Iceland. And, as the story goes, Saimundra was successful in tricking the devil, and freed from his grasp, he returned to Iceland. In Scandinavia, similar mentions of the Black School can be found in stories about Cyprian the Mage, often depicted as a Faustian character at odds with the devil. It is said that, after attending the diabolical Black School, out of spite, he wrote a compendium of spells which later became known as the Svarteboken, or the Black Books of Elverum. And finally, the last honorable mention of the Black School in European folklore brings us close to home. In Hungarian and Serbo-Croatian folklore, the Black School is also referred to as the 13th College, and it is once again located somewhere unknown, and is frequented by students similar to the Solomonari. If throughout the mentions of the Black School so far we had yet to encounter distinct mentions of weather forging and dragon riding, they are prevalent in Hungarian folklore just as much as they are beyond the Transylvanian border. Phonetically similar to the Romanian versions Grabuncaș, the Garabonciaș of Hungarian folklore, sometimes called wandering scholars and black students due to the robes they wear at the school, are wizards who dress as beggars who influence the weather. They mount on dragons called Sharkani that cause thunderstorms and tornadoes and glide through the air. In Serbo-Croatian myth, their group is said to consist of no more nor less than twelve students to correspond with the Wheel of Fortune of the Witches or the Virgilian Circle. The Romanian, Hungarian and Serbo-Croatian storm wizards are so similar. They are all seen as custodians of crops who have been demonized by the Christian Church. And in one very similar story to that told in the Romanian magazine of 1878, a priest near Doni Vidovets in Croatia is said to have witnessed one Garabonsia reading from a large book at the marsh in his village where a dragon was believed to dwell. All of a sudden, the water started to be disturbed, and a dragon's head appeared. The Garabonsia then grabbed the golden bridle and threw it over the dragon, and he kept on reading from the book. When the dragon's body was half out of the water, the Garabonsias jumped upon him and rode him to the south. The dragon had such a long tail that he dragged one part of it along the ground as he flew. Suddenly a wind came up. It clouded over and hail began to fall, as fat as a walnut, so that it destroyed everything around. The shepherds on the upland pasture grazing their cows could clearly see the dragon's tail as well as its rear legs. The priest said later that the Garabonsias had ridden the dragon to Africa. The dragon has such cold flesh that the Africans put a piece of it under their tongue and it kept them cool all day. The story echoes the Romanian folk tale from the summoning incantations down to the flight to warmer places where the Solomonar offers to the people either a scale from his dragon or an icy stone made by it that they keep in their homes to be safe from the hot weather. And so the Garabonziash is similar to the cloud banisher Solomonari. 
They learn how to influence the weather at a wizarding school. They have a magical walking stick which carries them to the clouds. They conjure dragons using their magical book. They ride the dragons through the clouds. They create terrifying tempests when people don't show them the most minimal hospitality. And they can also turn milk into blood if they are refused a cup. And, interestingly, it is said that they can also turn into animals to fight for good weather, similarly to the living Strigoi in Romanian folklore. Hungarian folklore also provides a corresponding figure for the cloud-walking Solomonar, the Taltos, a shaman and weather sorcerer whose birth may be unusual and whose powers are inborn. They are said to have the ability to enter deep spiritual trances during which they can heal wounds and diseases, learn hidden truths, and ascend to the heavens among the clouds and stars. The Taltos and Garabontiash are said to have been active at least until the Habsburg era alongside the Solomonari. Solitary sages and sorcerers such as them were painted as the tall takers of credulity in Eastern Hungary and Transylvania in the 18th century. One such Taltos was believed to be a woman by the name of Orshi Toth. She was accused of magic and witchcraft and of bewitching people and animals in 1728. She admitted to the court that she was also a weather magician, or at least she described her weather magician activities along with the heavenly battles. In her testimony, she claimed that as a weather magician, she took great responsibility in protecting the town's crops and vineyards from the catastrophe of a hailstorm, stating, They would gladly send me away from the city, but they don't know how much good I have done to this town. I didn't mind people being envious of me. I kept the seedling crops and grapes around the town safe. I protected. I fought when the evils wanted to bewitch. Back in Transylvania, one of the first written mentions of Solomonari was in the 1652 Code of Laws of the Valachian Prince, Matei Basarab, who, as a fierce promoter of Eastern Orthodoxy, referred to them as cloud banishers and ordained those who trusted them to six years' penance. At the time, the Solomonari were believed to play an important role in the lives of the people due to their meteorological function. They would call upon the rain in times of drought, or they would banish the clouds in times of downpour. Mysterious, they always seemed to appear exactly when needed, and while sometimes their arrival was a good omen, other times it meant that the moral judgment of the people was underway. Dressed as beggars, they would wander from village to village asking for alms, and should the people refuse them, awful storms and tempests would befall their households. But should people help them, they would chant verses in unknown languages that would bestow good fortune upon their households. And the Solomonari would then vanish in clouds of mist and fog. Accounts of encounters with them still make rounds today, especially in the Apuseni Mountains, a place that locals believe to be the gateway to the other world due to the strange things and apparitions that always seem to happen there. An elderly villager from the foothills of the mountains recounted in an interview in 2018 that her father witnessed a Solomonar punishing someone who did not show them compassion. According to her story, when her father was still young, a man appeared in the village asking for food. He first went to a neighbor's house to beg, but the matron of the household refused and chased him away. He then went to her father's family, who shared with him the little they had. After he finished eating, the Solomonar went up the hill, opened a thick book, and began chanting from it. Dark clouds gathered above the village, and a thunderstorm erupted, ripping trees from the roots which rolled downhill, as if by design, only stopping on the household of the unkind woman. In the same region, people still light torches made of sheep's wool when they see the dark clouds coming. The heavy scent emanating from the torches is believed to reach the sky and alert the storm wizards that the area is inhabited so they wouldn't unleash the weather upon them. The same people also remember that the lakes and ponds surrounding their villages might be inhabited by dragons, waiting asleep until their riders come to wake them. And they believe that such dragons were once snakes charmed by storm wizards. Once charmed, the snake had to elude human sight for seven years and, if successful, it would transform into a dragon. The folklore and stories surrounding the Solomonar and their school are abundant in Transylvania, with too many to tell. But one thing is clear, 
the storm wizards are seen as solitary sages, holy men and women who pay a great price for knowledge and who, despite their immeasurable powers, only descend among the people to remind them to be kind to each other. And their school is seen as a sacred place where only the worthy and wisest may enter. An elderly shepherd from the same area of the Apusen Mountains beautifully said that the Solomonar converses with the atmosphere. That's how wise he or she is. To converse with the weather, there must be something there, he said pointing to his forehead. Rather touching, his statement reflects a collective spirit of reverence and profound admiration for the shaman sage. The archetype reconciles the sacred and the profane, and is now, as it was then, an intermediary between the simple folk and divinity, an interpreter of divine signs and truths, and the source of wisdom in the face of chaos. And so, if one were to attend the scholomans, they ought to nurture their intellectual curiosity and reconcile with their innate divinity, and maybe then the school would reveal itself maybe not as a physical location. Regardless of what it may have been once upon a time, the Scholomance is now an ancestral school of thought that reminds us of a transhuman reality that, above all, teaches the magical power of cosmic and spiritual reconciliation and compassion. Thank you for watching. Until next time, remember, kindness begets magic.